If you've coded in Python before, you've probably come across the main Python libraries. Two of the biggest examples, of course, being NumPy and SciPy. These examples are used extensively in the scientific community, and for a good reason. They provide many important functions that are used all the time in scientific research. But compared to what we're about to explore, they're nothing. With the right tools, you can take a simulation of 400 particles and turn it into a simulation of 10,000 particles, but at no extra time cost. The secret, of course, is proper utilization of computer hardware, and more specifically, the GPU, which most people have access to these days. Welcome to the fifth episode of the Python GPU series, the ideal gas law. If you guys want to support the channel and learn how to code just like me, I highly recommend checking out my Udemy course, Python STEM Essentials. The coupon code in the description, you can get the course for $10 for the next five days. All the code that we use in this video today to verify the ideal gas law is going to be based on code I wrote in another video where we verified the Boltzmann distribution. Now the principles of it is pretty simple. You have a bunch of billiard balls confined to a box. And initially in the simulation we did in the other video, all the billiard balls are approaching each other at a velocity of 500 meters per second. Now they start to collide with each other. We assume they're circles or spheres. They collide with each other. They collide off the sides of the box. And as time goes on, the distribution of their velocities eventually approaches the Boltzmann distribution. Now that verifies one physical law. Now today we're also going to use that code in order to verify the one of the most well-known equations in physics, uh, PV equals NRT, or the ideal gas law. Uh, so be sure to check out that video as we'll be using a lot of code from that video. In fact, I recommend most people who are really interested in this video to check out that video first, though we will really briefly review the code of that video first. So as a brief review, we're doing a particle simulation. We need to give initial positions of all the particles. So in this case, I have 16 particles and I'm uh, sort of randomly assigning their initial positions here as R and I need to import my packages. So I uh, sort of give their initial position R here. So I have 16 particles. I have, in this case, it's 2D. I have uh, 16 different positions here. So then what I do is I can color particles that start on either side or at least make a note of them, which ones are starting on the right hand side and which ones are starting on the left hand side. So any of the X positions greater than 0.5 of the box has a length of one, which it does in this case when I randomly generate their positions between zero and one. Uh, so any of these locations are zero or the X position is greater than 0.5. Those correspond to true. So the, those are places where the particles on the right uh, particles on the left and I can sort of color them. Uh, so I specifically choose the ones that start on the right, color them as red, specifically choose the ones that start on the left, color them as blue. And you can sort of see my simulation like this. And now the idea is that all these particles here, we're gonna make the red ones move to the left at 500 meters per second, the blue ones move to the right at 500 meters per second. That's the initial state of our simulation. So we do that here, assigning the initial velocities. And then what we do is we assign each particle a unique ID. So I have 16 particles. These become my initial IDs, of course, which I can look at. So it's just zero to 16. It's nothing too fancy here, sorry, zero to 15. And what's interesting about the IDs is I can use these IDs to track pairs of different particles. Remember throughout the simulation, we track um, distances between pairs to see if the two particles collide. So I give my initial IDs like this, and I can use combinations to get a 2D array um, of all the different pairs of particles. So if I look at my IDs pairs here, you can see that all the different pairs, well, there's zero one, so that corresponds to the pair zero one. Uh, there's of course things like the pairs six, eight, essentially. So although we have 16 different particles, we need to track all the different distances between pairs of particles, which of course is gonna be more than 16. So I define my IDs and my pairs of IDs. And from these pairs of IDs, I can get pairs of X positions or pairs of Y positions. So in this case, I take my IDs uh, pairs zero. So this gives all the first pairs of the particles and this gives all the corresponding second particles like that. And by indexing all the first pairs of particles, I get my X positions XI. And here I get all the XJ positions. So this gives me the corresponding X values for each pairs. So they essentially match each other. So you can see I have an X position and an X position here. 
that corresponds exactly to the ID's pairs array. So it gives the exposition of this particle, exposition of that particle. That's essentially what I'm tracking here and here. Now, the purpose of this is to compute the distance between particles. So if I track my X pairs and my Y pairs, I can compute my delta X and delta Y. So if I take uh, torch.diff uh, X pairs, and I need to specify uh, axis equals uh, one, so my X pairs arrays, of course, there's the pairs of two particles here. I take the difference between those and I get delta X between all the different pairs of particles. Same thing with delta Y. And from that, I can compute the distance between all the particles here. And so if I look at my D pairs, of course, this corresponds to the distance corresponding to, if I look at my ID's pairs array, distance between these two particles. Then the next one is the distance between these two particles kind of like uh, this and then this and then this. Now those distances can be used to determine whether or not the particles collide. So you look for places where the distance is less than two times R, where R is the radius of the particles to determine if the two particles have actually hit and sort of collide off each other. So from that, I look at uh, any of the distances of the pairs that are less than two times the radius. So here, of course, the radius I'm setting to 0.06. Now here on this plot, of course, these are really small dots. 0.06 is a fairly large radius. So we can see which of these particles are currently undergoing collision as the simulation starts. Now with that size of radius, it's likely these two are sort of colliding, maybe these two uh, and so on and so forth. So I can look at all the locations of the IDs pairs where the distance between the pairs is less than twice the radius. And I get the following pairs of particles that are undergoing collision. Uh, then you can modify the velocities based on conservation of momentum. Now we're assuming all the particles have the same mass. In that case, this becomes the new equation for the new velocities. So you take the initial velocity of the first particle, the initial velocity of the second particle. So this, of course, is the first particle, the second particle. And we can choose that convention for like, this is always the first particle, this is always the second particle. And we can use that to update the velocities. So for example, if I look at IDs pairs collide one, this becomes all the different V2s or the particles that we're gonna treat as V2 in this case. Whereas these are all the particles we're going to treat as V1 in this case, and we'll update them all at the same time. So I compute my uh, initial velocities, I get the positions at these corresponding pairs of collision, and then I can update the velocities here. I recommend anyone watching this video and going through the code to really sort of think about what's happening here and run things individually to see what's going on. So then I can compute my new velocities, V1 new and uh, V2 new, and of course those are going to depend on uh, sort of the angle at which they collide. So some of them are colliding maybe like this and then they hit off on an angle. So although they're both coming like this and hitting, maybe they collide like this and go off on an angle. That's sort of what's happening here. Uh, then you can essentially run a simulation where you have your initial positions, your initial velocities, you sort of iterate through, the particles hit off each other. Uh, they also hit off the sides of the walls of the box. That's gonna be really important in this simulation when we consider pressure and you update and you update. And um, so of course the velocities are going to change. And in the last video, we showed that the distribution of those velocities approach the Boltzmann distribution. Now what's important in this simulation is we're assuming that if a particle hits the edge of the box, so here's the edge of the box, the particle comes in, we assume an elastic collision and the particle reverses the direction of its velocity corresponding to sort of how the box is oriented. So for example, in this case, it reverses its X velocity, but its Y velocity is always going upwards when it hits. So these are some functions that summarize the code that we did above. We compute the distance between the pairs. We compute new velocities. Uh, we start with our initial uh, R and V, those are initial positions and velocities. We give in the ID uh, pairs, of course, the number of time steps, delta T between time steps, and D cutoff, which of course is twice times the radius. Then we get our initial state. So that's, we're tracking the all the positions of all the particles at every single time step. So this is the position of all the particles at the first time step. Then I iterate through all the different time steps. I get the indices corresponding to collision. That's what IC stands for. So those are all the places, of course, where the uh, distance squared between the pairs is less than D cutoff squared. The reason I compute square distance is because it's faster than computing the square root. Uh, then for all those particles that are colliding, I update their velocity. And for any of the particles hitting the walls of the box, I sort of reverse that component of the velocity. So for example, this is a particle hitting the right-hand side of the box, and so its X velocity gets updated, and that's essentially what I'm doing here. Uh, then I update the position of all the particles using R is equal to R plus V times DT. That's just an equation for position, uh, you know, given a specific velocity. And I add those to the positions, um, all the different positions at all the different times throughout the array. So I corresponds to the I time step here. Uh, then I return the positions of all the different particles at all the different times and same with the velocity. 
So here I run a basic simulation that has 3,000 particles, the following time delta t between time steps, uh, 2,000 different time steps. I give initial velocity of 500 meters per second approaching each other, side length of the box uh, L equals one, initial positions like I did above, initial velocities, and I can run the simulation like this. So the simulation has finished running. And for example, here I look at the 455th time point. You can see all the particles have moved around the box. And as I update this and I go to future time points, you can see that the particles are slowly moving around. So they're bouncing off each other. Maybe if I go a little bit slower and just uh, update maybe two at a time. So here's two time steps later, you can see they've started to move a little bit. Two steps later, you can sort of pick a particle, for example, this one here and look at it. And of course it's moving ever so slightly. And so the particles are bouncing off each other, bouncing off the walls. And in the last uh, video, we showed that this, their distribution of velocities approaches the Boltzmann distribution. So that brings us to this video where we want to prove the ideal gas law. And a sort of nicer way to write it for this video is PV is equal to N, that's the total number of particles. So like 3000 particles uh, times Boltzmann constant, that's just a constant uh, times temperature. So in order to verify this equation, we have to really be careful what we mean by pressure and temperature. Remember, we just have a number of particles that are bouncing off each other and hitting walls. So how do we define pressure and temperature here? Well, we'll start with V. So volume is just L cubed, where L is the side length of the box. That's easy enough. N is the number of particles. Um, but for temperature, of course, you'll note that um, the kinetic theory of gases says that the uh, energy or the average energy of particles is three halves times Kb times T. So if you note that energy in this case is equal to kinetic energy, one half m of the average squared, remember it's the average energy of the particles is three halves kBT. Um, then you can sort of arrange to get temperature is equal to this. So as long as we know the average velocity of all the particles, we can compute the temperature. Now remember that no energy is lost in the simulation. You always have elastic collisions with the box and the particles that are colliding are also undergoing elastic collisions. So there's no loss in energy. So whatever V averages at the start of the simulation, it remains that throughout the simulation. So what that means is based on your initial state of the simulation, you assign all the initial velocities of the particles, you can compute the temperature. So the temperature is independent of the simulation itself. It's just assigned as soon as you assign the initial state of that simulation based on whatever V averages as your initial state. So we can plug in this temperature to the right hand side of the equation and we get right hand side is equal to this quantity here. And that part, that quantity, like I said, this can be computed only based on the initial state of the simulation. So you give me the number of particles here, you give me the mass of the particles, you give me the uh, average velocity when we start the simulation and I can compute for you the right hand side of the simulation. Now, of course, we want to verify the ideal gas law based on the simulation. So as it'll turn out, the pressure, that's the one variable here that depends on the simulation itself. And of course, what is pressure in real life? Well, the pressure is gas hitting the sides of the walls of a container, imparting momentum to that container and keeping it sort of pressurized. And so we'll get into defining pressure very carefully in this video. So remember that uh, the classic equation, pressure is equal to force over area. So here we have a box of uh, volume L cubed what is the area that the molecules are exerting pressure on? Well, if you think of the fact that a box has six different sides to it, and each side has area L squared, then the pressure is equal to whatever force is exerted on the box, the total force divided by six L squared. So then the whole thing here becomes about computing the force that's exerted on the box. Well, the force is gonna be exerted by particles hitting the sides of the box and bouncing off in the opposite direction, and imparting momentum to the box. So every time the particle hits the box and reverses direction, you get a little bit of momentum sort of given to the box. And you'll note that force is related to momentum. Of course, force is equal to the change in momentum over change in time. So you can think of, we have our simulation, you have all these particles hitting the sides of the box. They exert all these little changes of momentum and you sort of run that simulation for a certain length of time. You sum up all those little changes of momentum divided by the total time and that gives you the force. So that's how the left-hand side of the ideal gas law is related to the simulation itself. You have all these particles, they're bouncing off the walls, you track all the momentum transfer to the walls, and through the simulation, you can actually compute the pressure. So we track all the particles, we compute the changes of momentum as they hit the sides of the box and bounce off, 
And then the force is just the sum of all these absolute momentums divided by t, where t is the length of time of the simulation. So if you know that momentum is equal to mass times velocity and v is equal to l cubed, you plug all this into the left-hand side of the equation here, and you get this as the following left-hand side of the equation. Now computing the sum of delta vi depends on the simulation itself. So you have this right-hand side of the equation that depends on the initial state. You run the simulation, then you compute the left-hand side, and by showing that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, you've used the Monte Carlo simulation in order to verify the ideal gas law. Now you might note that each side of the equation, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, depend on the little m here, so that's the mass of the particles. So really, we just cancels out on each side of the equation. So if you show that left-hand side divided by mass is equal to right-hand side divided by mass, then you've equivalently sort of provided a verification for the ideal gas law here. So of course, in our simulation before, we did it in two dimensions. In this case, we're considering three dimensions here. So now I have uh, sort of R0, 1, and 2 as the components. I compute delta x, delta y, and delta z, for which I compute the distance between all the pairs here. Uh, computing the new velocities becomes exactly the same. And then the motion here looks pretty similar too. So I have all my positions of all the particles at every time, same with the velocities. I start with my initial state and sort of I iterate through the um, iteration here like this. And of course, what I need to do is I need to track this sum delta vi of all the particles hitting the walls at each time point. And that's sort of what I do here. So I look for the velocity of all the particles hitting the right hand side of the box. And of course, those change their x velocity. Now the delta vi at that particular time step gets updated with twice that velocity. Remember that it's starting in one direction and then it's completely switching directions. So the total imparted momentum is equal to two times that initial velocity because it's not only hitting the wall and stopping, it's hitting the wall and changing direction. So I do that for the right-hand side of the box, the left-hand side, the front, the back, and the top and the bottom here. Um, so that sort of tracks the delta vi of all the different particles. Remember each time step, you could have many different particles hitting the sides of the box. So this dvi, i is the time step, there could be many particles hitting the sides of the box at that particular time step. And that gives you the total momentum imparted to the box at that time step. Uh, then I update my positions, of course, like I did before, I sort of track the positions and velocities at that particular time step, and I can return the positions, velocities, and the total sort of change in momentum, of course, here it's the change in velocity, but it's the same thing because all the masses are the same. Uh, and I return those for each time step. So here I have my code for running the simulation. I have 3000 particles. Uh, this is the delta T between time steps. I'm gonna run for 2000 time steps. Uh, this is basically an array of all the different times, uh, my initial velocity, yada, yada, the same thing I had before, only in this case it's three dimensional instead of two dimensional for the position. Uh, I get my IDs and my ID pairs, my velocities. I set my initial velocities, my radius, and I run the simulation. So the simulation is just run, and what we can do is we can take a look at the change in velocity delta vi, this really should say delta vi, at each time step i induced by the particles hitting the wall. So here I'm plotting time versus delta vi, and you get this sort of interesting looking thing here that doesn't quite look what you would expect. Remember that the sum of all the vi's here should be proportional to the pressure, which is constant, and in this case the pressure does not appear to be constant. Now that has to do with the fact that our initial state of the gas where you have particles on the right, particles on the left moving towards each other, that's not actually what happens in a real gas. Of course, a real gas follows the Boltzmann distribution where all the particles are moving with a specific distribution of velocities. Now what's beautiful as we showed in our last video, no matter what the initial distribution of velocities and positions is, you eventually reach the Boltzmann distribution. So no matter how ordered your gas is when you start the simulation, as things collide with each other and collide off the walls, eventually you reach what a true gas distribution would look like. And that's sort of at these later time points here. So yes, there is noise in the simulation. Obviously there's a finite number of particles. The pressure is going to change, but it is relatively constant here as opposed to here where you have the particles from the right, they kind of go like this, they miss each other and then they all kind of hit, start hitting the wall. They bounce off and then they all start hitting the wall. Um, and then over time, of course, the particles are hitting each other and then they eventually start hitting all the walls. That's essentially what's happening here in these later time points. So we really wanna compute the pressure at these later time points when we've reached the Boltzmann distribution of velocities, which is really representative of an ideal gas in a container.
So we're gonna take the last 1,000 points, and from that we can compute the left-hand side of the equation. The left-hand side, like I said, this depends on the simulation itself. We have dv, which we got from the simulation. We're taking the last 1,000 points, and we're gonna divide it by, well, n points divided times dt is equal to the total length of time. There's the 6L squared factor here, and I'm summing them all together, and I get about 2.5 times 10 to the 8. I can compute the right-hand side of the equation. Well, that's just listed above here. It's just uh, n over m, nm over 3 times v average squared. Of course, we're con not considering m here. We're imagining that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are divided by m. Um, and I can compute the right-hand side, and I also get 2.5 times 10 to the 8. So I've essentially verified here the ideal gas law for a particular initial state. Now what we can do is we can do it for a few different initial states here. So here I have a function that runs the simulation for different V naught values. Of course, in our past simulation, we considered V naught is 500 meters per second. Um, now considering different V naughts is equivalent to considering different temperatures. Remember that temperature here, T, is proportional to V squared. So essentially what I'm doing here in the simulation is I start with different initial velocities. That's like starting with different temperatures. And we're gonna show that this um, sort of result holds for different temperatures as well. Of course, the ideal gas law holds for all different temperatures. So this will run the simulation and compute the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation for a particular value of V naught. So of course, here I define a bunch of different V naughts and I compute the left-hand side and right-hand side for all these different initial configurations or different initial temperatures. All right, so the simulation has just finished running. Um, so I've computed both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which I define uh, sort of here, right-hand side, left-hand side, for all these different configurations and for all these different uh, simulations. Of course, I can plot the right-hand side versus the left-hand side, and these quantities look sort of strange here, but really, of course, this y-axis is proportional to pressure, the x-axis is proportional to temperature here. And we can see on this plot that the quantities are equal and there's that nice linear relationship between pressure and temperature, which of course the ideal gas law predicts. Now, of course, in this video, we showed that uh, pressure is proportional to temperature, but of course there's more results you can show for the ideal gas law. So there's some extra exercises here for viewers, for example, showing that pressure is proportional to one over V, uh, pressure is proportional to N, and it all has to do with, of course, separating it into a left-hand side that depends on the simulation and a right-hand side that depends on the initial state. And so you run the simulation, you show that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, and you've provide Monte Carlo verification for an aspect of the ideal gas law. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. Of course, join the Discord server. Um, check out my Udemy course as well, uh, the introduction to Python. And uh, I'll see you next time.